Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Javedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati. And what we were discussing, we were discussing about the different aspects of the uh, cells or the biological system. In this context, so far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the uh, structure of the uh, cells, whether it is a prokaryotic cell or the eukaryotic cell. So in the current uh, module, what we are discussing, we are discussing about the cellular metabolism. So we have discussed about the uh, carbohydrate metabolisms, lipid metabolisms, and in addition, when we have, we have also discussed about the uh, the protein synthesis. And uh, so all the, the purpose of these catabolic reaction is to generate the energy. And then this energy is actually going to be utilized for the synthesis of the new biomolecules. And if you see that the synthesis of these new biomolecule is directly linked to the growth of that particular organism and subsequent to that, it is actually going to result into the uh, division of these cells and so that the number of cells are actually going to increase. And this is what we have discussed in the previous lecture. In the previous lecture, we have discussed about the cell division and how the different phases are present in the cell division during the and uh, we have discussed about the interface, we have discussed about the uh, S phase, G1 and G2 and as well as the M phases. And in the previous lecture, we have also seen how you can be able to, uh, how you can be able to experimentally uh, verify the cells in the different stages, whether it is the mitosis, meiosis or the different cell cycles uh, study by the flex, uh, flow cytometry. In the current uh, lecture, what we are going to discuss, we are going to discuss about the programmed cell death. So, as the name suggests, this is the this these are the set of uh, uh, set of the uh, cascades of reactions which are going to be governed by the molecular players, and they are responsible for the death of the cell in a very very uh, systematic way, so that it should not cause any harm to the organisms. Now first, uh, let's discuss about what is the life cycle of a cell. So, in a, if we, if you think about the life cycle of a cell, it starts with a uh, it, it starts with a cell, okay, whether it is a prokaryotic cell or the eukaryotic cell. And when the cell take up the nutrition from the outside, it is actually going to take this nutrition and generate the energy, right? This energy it is going to be generated by the catabolic reactions. And uh, we have there we have discussed about the carbohydrate metabolism and as well as the lipid metabolisms. This energy is actually going to be used for many purposes, such as this is going to be used for the growth of the cell, and it is also going to be used for the reproduction, right? Because every cell wants to increase its number, so it's going to be used for the reproduction of the cell. Now this will continue until the uptake of the nutrition and the production of energy would be on a higher side compared to the energy what it requires for the other kinds of processes. And uh, after some time when the cell will go through a process of aging, what happen is that the cell will actually go to the different types of changes, right? One of the things, one of the serious change is that it's actually going to enter into a non-dividing phase which is called as G0 phase and uh, once it enters into the G0 phase it will stop the division right so it will not going to produce new cells and on the other hand it is actually going to just maintain the basal level of activities and as a result uh, it is not going to perform many functions. After this it will enter into another phase which is called as death phase right because the, every, every cell has its uh, definite lifespan, so it is actually going to enter into the death. And the death within the cell can be induced by the two different uh, processes. It can be done either by a programmed method or a programmed manner, which is called as programmed cell death or apoptosis. Or it can be done in a another method which is called as necrosis okay uh, we are going to discuss in detail about the differences between the program cell death apoptosis as well as the necrosis and what are the contrasting feature of these two things so uh, uh, and 
either of these methods are responsible for the death of the cell right and the cell has to take a decision whether it wants to go for the apoptotic pathway or the necrotic pathway so in today's lecture what we are going to discuss we are going to discuss what actually induces the cell to go for a suicide pathway or the apoptotic pathway uh, what is the definition of the apoptosis and its major features right so what are the different hallmarks of the apoptosis what are the different events are happening and then the steps involved in the apoptosis difference between the apoptosis and the necrosis the pathway which are involved in the apoptosis so apoptosis can be uh, produced or can be induced by the external factors and as well as the internal factors and then what is the relevance of the apoptosis in the overall biology of the organisms how it is actually affecting the other uh, kinds of uh, or processes especially the development now the first question comes why the cell actually com commits the suicide or i will say program death okay so as as, as we discussed right the cell is actually going to take up the nutrition and this nutrition is actually going to produce the energy energy in the form of the atp or energy in the form of reducing equivalent such as nadh right and uh, the purpose of these energy sources are that it is actually going to be used for the growth of the cell it is actually going to be used for reproduction and apart from that it is also going to be used for maintaining the cellular integrity okay what is mean by the cellular integrity is that uh, this energy is actually going to be utilized for maintaining the electrode potential or uh, plasma membrane potential right so actually what happen is that it is actually going to run the uh, the pumps right so sodium potassium pumps or proton pumps and as a result it is actually going to throw the proton outside right and uh, so that there will be a potential what is going to be developed right so it is actually going to generate a potential across the plasma membrane because of that it is actually going to have the negative charge inside and positive charge outside or i will say it is actually going to have the negative uh, polarity onto the plasma membrane and because of that if you have any object which is outside like for example the glucose molecule right so glucose will not enter into the cell because it does not it is it is actually a charged membrane so this molecule cannot enter passively inside the cell it has to go through by a process of a receptor so it actually has to go through with a either through the receptor mediated endocytosis or it actually has to use the transporters to enter into the cell right and that's how it actually mean, uh, going to decide or it is actually going to maintain a electrode potential and that electrode potential is helpful in terms of uh, stopping the entry of the external factors for example if you have a water molecule right the water molecule can easily enter into the cell right but it does not because the water is will actually going to use the water channels or water is actually going to be because if you can imagine that if the water will keep coming into the cell the cell will actually going to expand right so it is actually going to increase its size and ultimately it is actually going to burst right and that is what is going to happen when you are actually going to have the osmotic lysis so uh, these are the some of the things which actually cell opposes throughout its life right and for that only it is actually spending the energy in the form of the atp or nadh uh, apart from that it also require the energy for any many more things actually it's okay so once the cell is weak or cell is getting through a process of aging it actually has reduced its ability to produce the enough amount of energy and when it does not produce the enough amount of energy what it actually can do is it is actually has to cut down the activities it has to cut down the activities so it actually will cut down the active first thing what it will actually going to do is it will cut down the activity of cell division right 
This means it will enter into the G0 phase. Just to conserve the energy, right, it will enter into the G0 phase. In the second event, what it actually will do is it will actually going to, uh, you know, it, it will not going to uh, use the, uh, you know, so if, if the energy is still going to be on a lower side, then it will decide whether I should be able to maintain my integrity or not because cell is cell only until it is actually having a integrate system actually. Okay. Once it actually become porous, right, and it can allow the cells, uh, allow the entry of the external molecules, then the cell will eventually going to burst. And since the cell will actually going to burst and release its content into the external media, it is not going to be good for the organism because if you release the cellular content in one shot, right, it is actually going to create the, uh, you know, the the disturbance to the homeostasis. So, because to avoid this, what it actually going to do is when it reaches to that point where it will not be able to maintain or it will not be able to generate the enough energy, what it actually going to do is it is actually going to induce the programmed cell death. Which means it was actually going to say that, okay, I am no longer be in a state that I can be able to maintain my integrity. So let's go for the death pathway and then only it is actually going to go with the death. And as I said, you know, death could be induced by the uh, apoptosis or it could be necrosis. So apoptosis uh, or the cell uh, program cell death is a fundamental process in a multicellular organism which play a crucial role in the various biological processes such as development, tissue homeostasis, immune response and the elimination of the damage or the potentially harmful cell. So this is, you don't have to worry about all this because this is all we are going to discuss at the end of this lecture, how the apoptosis is involved in development, tissue homeostasis and elimination of the potentially harmful cells and all that. Uh, apoptosis is a tightly regulated physiological process that rapidly removes damaged, mutated or virus infected cell within organisms. And the major feature of an apoptosis is that it is a controlled and the ordered process in contrast to the necrosis. Okay? So apoptosis is also called as program cell death, which means you are actually going to do the programming to have the death of that particular cell. Right? That's why it is actually going to be a controlled and ordered process because you are going to do a programming. I'm sure many of you probably know about programming, right? So you actually give the steps or you are going to give the command to the particular uh, uh, computer, right? So, okay, go with this, go with this, go with this, right? And ultimately execute this and do this job, right? So the same way you are actually going to go with the stepwise uh, instruction to the cell and eventually the uh, last instruction would be that okay uh, induce the death right then we have the specific signaling pathway and the molecular event which actually going to drive the process and this all how you're going to do you're actually going to do this by having the specific signaling pathways because these signaling pathways are actually going to bring the molecular players and that's how they are actually going to make the process more controlled. Then the cellular components are dismantled leading to the cell shrinkage. Then DNA fragmentation occurs resulting into the characteristic ladder pattern. Apoptotic bodies are uh, apoptotic bodies, small membrane bound vesicles which are actually going to be formed. So shrinkage of the cell uh, uh, DNA laddering and as well as the formation of the apoptotic body. These are the hallmarks of the apoptosis. So if I have to identify an apoptosis in a cell, I will see whether it is forming the DNA fragmentation or not, if it, whether it, there are apoptosomes are formed or not, and whether the cytosol is shrinking or not, right? So that is are very di different from the, uh, from the necrosis. Now, what are the steps are involved in apoptosis? So, apoptosis actually is going to start from the cell, right? So, if first uh, step would be that the cell is actually going to receive a signal, right? This signal could be from the external signal 
or it could be an internal signal okay so it actually first step is that it actually going to receive the stimulus this stimulus could be external stimuli or it could be an internal stimulus then the once they receive the uh, stimulus it actually going to induce the shrinkage as well as the breakdown of the cytoskeleton which means it actually going to make the cell more flexible so that it can actually be able to get condensed then we have the dense cytoplasm and the packaging of the organelles then we have the condensation of the chromatin this process is called as the pycnosis then we have the induction of the uh, caspase activated uh, dns activity and that will induce the fragmentation of the gna dna means this is the fragmentation of the genomic dna and the breaking of the nucleus in the step 6 it is actually going to form the blobs and then step 7 there will be a cell break and the formation of the apoptotic bodies so these are the formation of the apoptotic bodies this means the individual cellular content is actually going to be encircled into the plasma membrane and that is actually going to be apoptotic apoptotic bodies these apoptotic bodies are not going to release the content they are actually going to be taken up by the Uh, macrophages and ultimately is that it is actually going to be phagocytosis so that will be that's why this is actually going to be a very safe way of uh, removing the particular dead or damaged tissue without even causing any kind of uh, adverse reactions now what is the difference between the uh, between the apoptosis and necrosis so in the apoptosis uh, you are going to have the intact cell membrane and the membrane blobbing is going to occur right so this is actually going to happen right so it is actually going to maintain intact cell membrane but there will be a blobbing into the membrane okay compared to that in the plas in, uh, in the necrosis there will be a disrupted cell membrane and there will be a loss of membrane integrity right so this there will be a loss of membrane integrity this means it is actually going to start losing the cellular content uh, as soon as the necrosis is going to occur into the cell right and uh, in the step 2 it's begin with the cell shrinkage and the condensation of the nucleus and then the pycnosis occurs which means the condensation of the chromatid and followed by the karyohexesis which is the fragmentation of the nucleus and ultimately there will be a formation of the apoptotic bodies so these are the formation of apoptotic bodies which means it is actually not going to release the cellular content into the external media or the outside instead it is actually going to release the apoptotic bodies and these apoptotic bodies are actually going to be phagocytosed by the macrophages so that they will be very 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 uh, safely they are actually going to be removed from the uh, from the environment compared to that uh, the in the during the necrosis it is actually going to be it begins with the swelling of the cell right so initially the cell is actually going to swell because it cannot maintain the integrity right followed by the pycnosis and the karyohexesis occurs followed by the karyolysis which means there will be a dissolution of the cytoplasm and ultimately there will be a complete lysis of the cell which will and there will be no apoptosome which is going to be formed and then ultimately it is actually going to release the complete cellular content and as a result of that it is actually going to cause a huge inflammatory reaction because this cellular content is uh, going to be uh, you know it, it actually going to attract the many type of cellular uh, many type of immune cells and once they come to that they will actually going to try to clear this and they will actually going to cause the inflammatory reaction which means they are actually going to secrete the inflammatory molecules and as a result there will be more damage into the vicinity where the necrosis is going to occur now coming back to the apoptosis the, there are multiple pathways which are involved into the apoptosis okay so in the apoptosis you have the three steps first is initiation second is uh, execution the third is the phagocytosis okay because after the execution it is actually going to form the apoptosome uh, and or apoptotic bodies which are and these apoptosomes are actually going to be phagocytosed okay so this two and uh, step number 2 and 3 are actually going to be the same 
for both the pathway but the initiation pathway can be different for the two uh, pathway okay because the first step is the stimulus right so if the stimulus is internal right then it is going to be intrinsic pathway. If the stimulus is external, then it is going to be intrinsic pathway or extrinsic pathway. So that is the only difference. Okay, if it is a internal factors such as a starvation, a loss of nutrition, uh, generation of free radicals, and all other kind of things, then it is going to be induced the intrinsic pathway. If it is an extrinsic pathway, then it could be external factors such as the uh, immunological molecules or the external ROS or uh, drug molecules and so on. Okay, So if you have these, then it is actually going to induce the external factors. It is going to cause the intrinsic pathway, extrinsic pathway. Where, whereas for intrinsic pathway, it could be uh, the starvation. It could be uh, the ROS, internal ROS, or it could be any other kinds of anomalies that actually going to be responsible for the intrinsic pathway. Once the initiation is done, then it is actually going to have the execution. So in the execution, you are going to have the uh, caspases, different types of caspases, and then ultimately it is going to form the apoptosome, and that actually is going to be phagocytosed by the phagosomes. So let's first discuss about the intrinsic pathway. So uh, in the mammals, the signals that induce apoptosis can either originate from the inside of the cell, that is the intrinsic pathway, or from the outside of the cell, which is called as the extrinsic pathway. Both signaling cascade ultimately leads to the caspase activation, which in which in many define the number of uh, in define the point of no return for the cell death. These death signaling epi events appear to be funneled to the mitochondria before the execution of the death by caspases into the mammalian cells. So, what are the molecular players involved into the apoptotic pathways? First is uh, caspases. So, caspases are the proteases. Are caspases are the group of protein involved into the apoptotic process? They are called they are so called because they contain a key cysteine residue into the catalytic site and selectively cleave the protein at a site and selectively cleave protein at a site just C terminal to the aspartate residue and caspases are the uh, proteases. All caspases are initially made as the procaspases which means they are actually going to be produced as the inactive uh, protease. and. Uh, ultimately they are actually going to be uh, you know generate the active protease and uh, by doing so they are actually going to be under the fine control which because the cell will contain the inactive protease but it will actually going when it's going to get the signal that okay convert the inactive protease to the active protease it is actually going to be start the cascade of reactions then we also have the um, uh, pro apoptotic factors and as well as the anti apoptotic factors. So, within the pro apoptic factor, these factors are promoting the apoptosis, such as BACs, BAD, BID, BOX, BIX, BAC, etc. Whereas we have the anti apoptotic factors, these factors are inhibiting the apoptosis, which means they are actually promoting the growth. So, these are called BCL2, BCL Xl, MCL1A, etc. And the ratio between the anti-apoptotic BCL2 and the pro-apoptotic BAF protein determine whether a cell will actually going to live or it is actually going to die with by the process of apoptosis. Now, in the intrinsic pathway or the mitochondrial pathway, you are going to have the you are going to have the initial uh, signal, right? So there will be a signal which is like DNA lesions, for example. If you have generated the mutations or DNA damage and these DNA damage are beyond the repairing okay because some of the DNA damage can be could be repaired but some of the DNA damage could be so much that it, it will decide that okay it is not worthwhile to uh, you know to uh, to repair the damage so instead of that it is actually going to in, take up that as a initiation signal and then it is actually going to activate the 
serine threonine kinase, the ATM serine threonine kinase, and that in turn is actually going to activate the production of the P53 transcription factors, and then P53 is actually going to activate the downstream uh, molecules like Puma. And then Puma is actually going to activate the backs within the cytosol and the backs activated backs becomes the mitochondrial membrane bound and as a result it is actually going to open the voltage gated channels right and it actually going to form the membrane attacking complex and once that happens it is actually going to release the cytochrome c from the mitochondria into the cytosol and that is actually going to be an initial event right once the cytochrome c is actually going to be released it is actually going to form a complex with the APA1, right? And once they will form a complex to with each other, it is actually going to form the apoptosome, which means the APA1 and the cytochrome C, when they come together, they are actually going to form the apoptosome. And the apoptosome is actually going to activate or is going to recruit the inactive caspase 9, and it is actually going to be activated to form the active caspase 9. So, from the active caspase 9, it is actually going to act onto the pro caspase. So, it is actually going to form the pro caspase 3. And it is actually going to act on the pro caspase 3. Okay. And then it becomes activated caspase 3. So, these are called executory caspase. These are called initi initiator caspase. So, activated caspase 3 is going to form an activated caspase 3 is actually going to activate the caspase activated DNAs. The ca once the caspase activated DNA is formed, it will actually go inside the nucleus and then it is actually going to form the, uh, it is actually going to start chewing the DNA. But it is very specific, so it is actually going to chew the DNA after every 180 nucleotides, okay, and that is how it is actually going to form a ladder like things right because it's every ladder is actually going to be different from each other by a by a number of 180 so first dna is going to be 180 first second dna is 360 then 540 then 720 like that okay so that's why it is actually going to form a ladder like this okay where you are between the two dna bands it is actually going to have a difference of 180 base pair. Okay. Uh, this all you will understand when we are going to talk about the DNA packaging. So you will understand how, why there is a difference of 180 base pair, right? And apart from the caspase activated DNAs, the caspase 3 is also going to be start acting on to the cytosolic as well as the nuclear protein and it is also going to start chewing up those proteins. So as a result, it is actually going to disturb the cellular machinery and uh, at the end it is actually going to cause the cell death then we have the extrinsic pathway so extrinsic pathway could be of two types extrinsic pathway where you have the tnf pathway or the fast light fast pathway in a tnf pathway you are actually going to, is going to be activated by the tnf alpha which is going to be secreted by the macrophages and other immune cells Whereas fast pathway is actually going to be activated by the fast ligand and fast ligand is present onto the some of the uh, immune systems or immune cells. So first discuss about the TNF pathway. So in a TNF pathway, the acceptor TNF R1, so this is actually going to be the receptor what is being responsible for the TNF pathway. So on one side, it is actually going to have the, so this is an inactivated uh, TNF, alpha, TNF receptor 1. And uh, why it is in, 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 in inactive because it actually contains the uh, death domain which is going to be captured, right? And uh, on the top, it does not have the TNF alpha, right? So, it's receptor TNF R1 contain an uh, intercellular part contains the death domain and is present on cell which is going to receive an apoptotic signal. The death domain is silent prior to the apoptotic signal, therefore, it is called as inactivated TNF alpha TNF R1. The TNF R1 receives an external signal triggering molecule called TNF alpha cytokines, which initiate the apoptosis. Conformational changes occur onto the intercellular part of death domain when the TNF alpha binds with the TNF alpha receptor 1. The death domain contains an inhibitory protein called SODD or the silence of death domain that keeps the 
that domain silent therefore the cell survives so what happen is that in activated tnf alpha when it enters the tnf alpha will actually going to bind this tnf alpha can come from another macro um, immune cells such as macrophages and as soon as that happens that the that domain is actually going to be active and then it is actually going to recruit the other uh, cytosolic uh, factors like trad fadd and then ultimately it is actually going to activate the caspase 8 okay so it's actually going to cleave the pro caspase 8 and that is actually going to make the active caspase and once the active caspase 8 is going to form it is actually going to induce the cell death by taking the help of the caspase 3 so after this actually it is actually going to activate the caspase 3 okay then we have the fast pathway right so in the fast pathway you have the two different types of protein one is signaling protein or i will say cytotoxic t lymphocyte for example right so example is cytotoxic t lymphocytes where you are going to have the target protein target protein is a cell which actually going to be go through process of apoptosis right so this is the apoptotic cell okay and this protein the target protein is actually going to have the fast receptor whereas the signaling cell is actually going to have the fast ligand okay and once the fast ligand which is present onto the signaling cell is actually going to interact with the fast receptor what is present on the target cell it is actually going to induce the apoptosis and so uh, how it happens you have the fast ligand what is present onto the signaling uh, what is present onto the signaling cell and then you also have the fast receptor what is present onto the target cell and when they interact with each other it is actually going to give you the signal and once they give the signal the death domain is actually going to act, uh, recruit the downstream uh, effector molecules and as a result it is actually going to activate the pro caspase 8 to form the active caspase 8 and the active caspase 8 is actually going to activate the pro caspase 3 to form the active caspase 3 and once the active caspase 3 is going to form it is going to act, uh, act onto the genomic dna and as well as the cytosolic protein and that's how it is actually going to induce the cell death so signaling cell is an immune cell which is called as cytotoxic t lymphocytes the cytotoxic t lymphocyte express a protein which is called as fos ligand uh, the, this ligand initiates the apoptosis through a series of reactions. The fast ligand binds to the target cell through a fast receptor present on it. Binding of the fast ligand with fast receptor send the first apoptotic signal. Fast receptor contains the intercellular dead domain. On binding the dead domain, recruit a FADD, that the fats associated with dead domain, adapter molecule that comes and binds to the dead domain of the fast receptor. The dead effector domain or DED of FADD molecule further recruit caspase 8, which gets activated and form the caspase 8. Then a bunch of molecule exi uh, existing together, which are called as the activated fast receptor or the FADD adapter molecule DED and a caspase 8 enzyme form a single complex called the disc right or death inducing signaling complex the death caspase cascade starts when caspase 8 is released from the disc and what happens that caspase 8 is actually going to activate the caspase 3 into the cas into the caspase active caspase 3 and the active caspase 3 is actually going to act onto the genomic dna and as well as onto the cytosolic as well as the nuclear protein and eventually it is going to induce the cell death okay now what will be the uh, what will be the relevance of this apoptotic pathway apart from the death okay it also has a relevance in many other features of the organisms so the one of the major re area where the apoptosis has a relevance is the, the development right so apoptosis is necessary in many developmental process during the limb formation the separate digits evolve by the death of the interdigital mesenchymal tissue so what you see here is that this is the this is the two uh, hands actually so in when you when the baby is uh, within the uh, womb right or whether during the developmental stage it actually has the hand 
uh, which actually contains the uh, membranes okay which actually contains the uh, skin actually right and these hands are called wedged hand okay and once the baby is born this these cells which are actually be a part of this uh, web is actually going to be digested or which is actually going to be killed by a process which is called as programmed cell death and as a result we are actually going to have the individual heads in the case of frog for example right frog does not have the individual uh, fingers right it actually has the finger like this because it helps the frog to float onto the cell or onto the water actually then we have the deletion of the cell no longer needed such as the amphibian tadpole tail during the metamorphosis so when the amphibia when the frog is uh, for, uh, is developing the, from the uh, from the tadpole so this is the tadpole right it contains a very long tail right but this tail is getting regressed when it is actually forming the adult uh, frog actually uh, what happens is this the cell what is present in this tail is actually going to be um, you know removed by a process which is called as the apoptosis then demise of the cell showing the sculpturing of the hollow tissue so this is uh, this is what happens when you are actually going to form the uh, form the um, body uh, siloam right okay so during the development you are actually going to have the degradation of these cells or death of these cells so that's how it is actually going to form a tube like structure for example the development of the elementary canal then we have the formation of the reproductive organs and the massive cell death occur during early stage of nervous system greater than 50 percent of the cell neural cell actually are going to die so what is the conclusion in conclusion, the apoptosis is a crucial process in a multicellular organism. It is a controlled and orderly form of cell death that plays a vital role in development, tissue homeostasis, and the immune system. Apoptosis is regulated by the specific signaling pathway and involves the molecular event leading to the cell dismantling and the formation of apoptotic body. Dysregulation of apoptosis is associated with the various types of tissue. One, is, one of such thing is formation of the uh, you know formation of the fingers with the webbed actually so in some of the kids when they are born these uh, webs are already present because the apoptosis it does not occur and they are actually going to have this and in those cases what people do is they will actually going to be surgically be removed by the doctor doctor actually uh, or sometimes what you see here is that the fingers are actually fused with each other so in that case is also it is actually going to be surgically be removed because the apoptosis did not get induced in those uh, particular uh, uh, people actually then understanding the mechanism and the significance of apoptosis opens venues for the septic intervention and shed light on the fundamental process of life and death so this is all about the apoptosis now if you would like to study the apoptosis in a cell you can actually be able to use some of the classical features for example in the when you have a cell and if it is inducing uh, if you are suppose treating this cell with a anti-cancer drug so eventually what will happen is you are actually inducing which are which you are so you are actually activating the in extrinsic pathway okay or you can actually uh, inducing the intrinsic pathway, whichever the, uh, you know, because it depends on the different types of cell, right? So different types of molecules. So it, you can actually be able to have both of these. So what happened is the cell is actually going to show you the three important features which can be exploited for studying the apoptosis. One is there will be a shrinkage or cell shrinkage, right? The second is there will be a DNA damage and the third is there will be a membrane polarity and both all of these uh, method apart from that you can also have the caspase activation so you can actually be able to uh, if you want to study the apoptosis you can use any either of these methods you can actually go with the dna damage you can look for the cell shrinkage you can look for the membrane polarity Membrane polarity, there will be a loss of membrane polarity, there will be a loss of molecules from that particular cell. So, uh, one of the very easy thing is that you can actually be able to stain the cell with particular type of dye 
and the dye is actually going to show you whether there will be a cell damage, membrane polarity or the caspase activation. So you can actually have the different types of substrate what you can actually use or you can use the dyes. So one such uh, approach is that where you are actually can use the combination of a uh, of a dyes which is called as acridine and propidium iodide and that you can actually be able to use for the monitoring the apoptosis. So what is the basic principle of this particular uh, assay? Propidium iodide is a membrane impermeable dye that selectively binds the DNA by intercalating into the double helix in live cell which has an intact membrane which means which actually has the intact membrane integrity. Propidium iodide is unable to enter the cell and therefore does not stain the nucleus. However, in cell with the compromised membrane integrity such as dead cells, propidium iodide can penetrate the plasma membrane and bind the DNA resulting into the red fluorescence. So propidium iodide is actually going to give you the intense red fluorescence, okay. To analyze the apoptosis using acridine orange and propidium iodide, a mixture of the dye is typically added to a cell suspension. In, in that cell suspension, what happened is the live cell is actually going to appear green because the propidium, uh, sorry, uh, uh, because the uh, acridine orange is actually going to give you the green fluorescence when the cells are live but it going to give you it is going to give you the orange or red fluorescence when the cells are under the apoptosis so this is for the live cell this is for the apoptosis cell so in a live so all the live cell is actually going to appear green Apoptotic cells are going to appear orange or the red depending upon the amount of or the degree of uh, fragmentations and the dead cells are actually going to appear as red, right? So these you are actually going to have three colors. You are going to have green which is for the life. You are going to have the orange which is for the apoptotic cell and you are going to have the red which is for the dead cell right and you can easily be able to identify all of these colors in a, in a technique which is called as flow cytometry and remember that we have very extensively discussed about the flow cytometry in our previous lecture so you can be able to uh, utilize the flow cytometry for this particular type right and these are the some of the material what you require for performing the AOPI apoptosis assay and this is the protocol. So you have to take the 10,000 cells, you are going to treat them with a, uh, with a uh, suitable um, anti-cancer compound or any other compound which you are thinking that the, it is actually going to induce the apoptosis or cell death and then you can actually be able to follow this and it is actually going to uh, give you the staining for uh, the cells. So working concentration for the AO is 1 to 2 microgram whereas for the PI it is 20 to 50 microgram and it is actually going to add it to the cell 15 to 20 minutes before acquiring the data on a flow cytometer equivalent and uh, as far as the data acquisition is concerned the after staining analyze the stain cell using a flow cytometer equipped with the appropriate filter for octidine orange and propidium iodide adjust the flow cytometer setting for the appropriate fluorescence and forward and scat side scattered parameters run the stain cell sample on the flow cytometer collecting data for at least 50,000 images right analyze the acquired data using flow cytometer software plot the scat scatter plot with pi on the y axis and the acidity orange on the x axis the first quadrant represents the healthy and the live cells and uh, you can partition that plot into the four quadrant the second third and fourth quadrant represent the early apoptotic late apoptotic and dead cell respectively and you can do the data analysis with the help of a software which is called fcs5 you can use any other software this software is not uh, exclusive okay and uh, ultimately what you're going to see you're going to see the results okay so what you're going to see is uh, this is the control right and this is the treat example okay but before uh, discussing about the results, um, we can actually take you to my lab and where the students are actually going to show you the complete protocol and how you can be able to uh, analyze or do the acquisition of these data into the flow cytometer and how you can be able to analyze the data to get this result. 
Hello everyone. In this video, we will be discussing about how to perform live dead cell staining using a threading orange and rubidium iodide on fat cell So the basic principle is that the threading orange is permeable to both the live and the dead cells, whereas the rubidium iodide uh, is only permeable to uh, late apoptotic and necrotic cells. So this uh, uh, this property of threading orange and rubidium iodide lets us uh, uh, to recognize uh, what population of cells. Uh, are in uh, late apoptotic or early apoptotic or necrotic cells. So coming to the procedure, the first thing we do is that we trichinize the, the cells from the 100 mm cell culture dish and then uh, plate uh, uh, 1 million each in the untreated and the treated uh, well. So after 12 to 14 hours of adherence, we treat the samples uh, according to our requirement and then let's say for that we are treating for 24 to 48 hours then after the appropriate time we trypsinize the cells collect the pellet wash it two times with PBS and then we suspend the pellet in 2% uh, uh, fetal proven serum in phosphate buffer saline so after we have resuspended the pellet in the 2% FPS uh, in phosphate buffer saline we give the appropriate agridin orange and propidium iodide treatment the working concentration for acrylating orange is 0.5 to 1 microgram per ml, whereas for the working concentration for rubidium iodide is uh, 1 to 5 microgram per ml. So we add the dyes just before taking the data, or we can just give 10 to 15 minutes of incubation for the for the dyes to bind to the cells. So that and after that we uh, record we acquire the data on the fax equipment. So after adding the acridin orange and propidium iodide to the cells, we have to acquire the data on the CellQuest Pro software. So the first thing we do is open the CellQuest Pro and connect it to cytometer. And then we need the counters, the detector and amps and the status. For uh, the uh, acridin orange propidium iodide staining, we need uh, two dot plots one is for the FSC SSC for the forward scattering and the side scattering and the other one is for the FL1 and FL3 so the FL1 uh, plot is on the x-axis whereas the FL3 plot is on the y-axis the FL1 plot uh, is for the acridin orange and FL3 plot is for the propidium iodide after uh, taking the plots, we have to set the directory and uh, save the data in our required location. In the detector and amps, we have to remember that we have to set the population of the healthy cells in the first quadrant that is 10 to the power of 1 and 10 to the power of 1. So uh, after we set the untreated cells in the first quadrant, and then we analyze the uh, treated cells and then we can say whether there is any shift in the fluorescence in the untreated and the treated cells for the treated cells in the third and the fourth quadrant that represents the apoptotic and the necrotic cells so now we will be uh, taking the sample but before uh, analyzing the data we have to set the number of events uh, to the 5000 and then uh, uh, keep it on setup and first we'll see whether uh, the events are coming properly or not now we press acquire as we can see that in the fsc plot and ssc in the fsc and ssc plot we can see the uh, events coming near 00, 0 that represents the healthy population as well as in the fl1 and fl3 uh, we have set the healthy population between the 10 to the power of 1 and 10 to the power of 1 so uh, this is this represents the first quadrant uh, we will show in detail how to do the quadrant analysis in the fcx square 5 software now that uh, we have set the population in the first quadrant we will remove it from setup and acquire the data After the untreated samples, we have to take the treated samples on the same uh, parameter description 
which we have set for the untreated cells. Now we change the sample uh, in the sample injection port to the treated sample. In the we have to remember that we don't have to change the uh, parameters or else we will never be able to say whether there is any shift in the untreated or the treated cells if we change the parameters. After changing the sample, now we have to uh, choose the directory for the treated cells and then change the name also to treated and also the file count to 1. Then press OK and then now we acquire the data on the same parameters. As we can see that there is some shift uh, in the population of the cells. The population uh, is having a little bit more fluorescence than the untreated cells which represents uh, the apoptotic and necrotic cells in the third and the fourth quadrant. In the fourth quadrant mostly the, the necrotic and the dead cells are present whereas in the third quadrant uh, uh, the late apoptotic cells are present. After we take the untreated and the treated samples, after we acquire the data for the untreated and the treated samples, uh, we have to analyze the uh, data in the FCS5 Express Pro software using quadrant analysis. In the quadrant analysis, we can see uh, uh, how much populations of cells are present in which quadrant and therefore we can identify the number of uh, healthy populations and the apop uh, apoptotic and the necrotic cells. So after uh, acquiring the data in the fax equipment, we have to now analyze the data in the FCS FireFest software. So the first thing we do is we open the new layout and change the orientation to landscape and then uh, now we input the data. And then first thing we do is uh, we take the untreated file and then uh, open the dot plot. We need two dot plots. Uh, the one is the uh, FSC SSC and the other one is the FL1 FL3. The FL1 FL3 dot plot shows the uh, live and dead cell staining. The FL1 is responsible for the acridin orange whereas FL3 is responsible for the propidium iodide. And uh, now we take the treated file and again we select the dot plot. In dot plot as well, uh, we need the FSC and the FL1, FL3 plot. As we can see that there is a, a difference between the untreated and the treated sample. Now we have to find out how much percentage of the cells have gone actually uh, the apoptotic or necrotic. Like uh, we have to divide the uh, population of cells into four quadrants using the quadrants option. So we go to the gating and then take the quadrant and then apply it on the FL1, FL3 plot. We have to apply it in such a way that we uh, cover all the cells in the untreated plot. So uh, let's say that uh, in the untreated plot we are having 93, 92% uh, 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 live cells uh, and 7% are in the early apoptotic phase and then uh, after applying the quadrant to the untreated we have to apply the same uh, quadrant to the treated one in order to find out the difference between the two. So just we click on the quadrant and then we copy and paste on the treated one. So in this way we can say that uh, in the first quadrant uh, in the untreated sample we have approximately 93% of live cells whereas in the treated one we have uh, uh, like in the treated one we have only 35.7 percent healthy whereas the 33 percent have gone are in the late apoptotic and 29 percent are uh, necrotic cells so in this way uh, we can use acridin orange and propidium iodide to determine uh, the healthy the apoptotic and the necrotic cells uh, in, in different treatments and also we can uh, establish 
uh, establish a relation between different uh, concentrations of treatment and the number of live and dead cells in any experiment. So uh, this is the way uh, we analyze the we analyze and process the data on the fax equipment uh, in order to do the live and dead cell staining. Hopefully, uh, this video was helpful. So once you uh, analyze the data, you are actually going to get this data, right? You are going to get these two curves, right, or these two plots, and these are called as the dot plots, okay? And where you are going to have the checkerboard analysis. So this is called as uh, checkerboard analysis, right? And in the checkerboard analysis, what you're going to do is you're going to make a checkerboard in such a way that you are going to keep all the healthy cells in the first quadrant. So this is the quadrant one, this is the quadrant two, this is the quadrant three, and this is the quadrant four, okay? In the quadrant one, you are going to have the low fluorescence for the apple three and low fluorescence for the apple one, which means it is actually going to be the healthy cells because they are not taking up the strong fluorescence signal or they are not taking up the dye from the of, uh, they are not taking up the dye which means their their membrane potential is, membrane uh, polarity is very high and that's why they are not allowing the dye to enter right when you treat these cells the cells are actually going to be apoptotic and as well as the dead so they will actually enter into the next quadrants so for example, this is the quadrant number one, which is the healthy cells, right? This is the quadrant number two, which is actually the early apoptotic cell, which means uh, now just the DNA damage started actually. So, uh, and that's why what you see here is that it has a very high uh, signal for FL1, but it has a very low signal for FL3, right? This means these are early apoptotic. And this is the late apoptotic because now the DNA is compromised and uh, so the, it actually has a very high signal for FL1 and also has a high signal for FL3 and that's why these are the late apoptotic cells. And uh, this is the cell where you have the low fluorescence like low FL1 and the high FL3 and these are the dead cells, right? So what you see here is that in the treatment, you have the 27% uh, dead cells uh 36 percent late apoptotic cells and the 11.8 percent early apoptotic cells and whereas 23.5 percent healthy cells so these are all about the apoptosis now when you're doing these kind of assays you always have to take a lot of precautions when you are analyzing the data when you are making a checkerboard and all that so that you should not make mistakes so that it should be make you biased or you should not be able to get the uh, you know the data which is unreliable so these are the some of the precautions what you have to follow uh, you have to acquire the uh, sig acquire the samples under the four degree and you also have to require uh, other kinds of uh, treatments uh, other kinds of precautions what you are supposed to take so this is all about the apoptosis as, or the programmed cell death. What we have discussed, we have discussed about why the cell is entering into the apoptosis, what are the critical factors which are inducing the apoptosis and what are different types of pathways which are in, responsible for apoptosis. So we have discussed about the in, is, is intrinsic pathway and we have also discussed about the extrinsic pathway. Within the intrinsic pathway, we have discussed about the molecular players which are governing the intrinsic or the extrinsic pathways. So, and at the end, we have also discussed about how you can be able to study the apoptosis with the help of the flow cytometry. So with this, I would like to conclude my lecture here. In a subsequent lecture, we are going to discuss some more aspects related to molecular biology. Thank you. Thank you.